say, say something. What about this? Is that back on? Okay. Yay. I did do something. I don't know how it happened. I don't know how it happened. <laughs> the universe was like, child free? We don't want to talk about that. <laughs> okay, that was two poems. Okay, yeah. All right. Back on, back on track. Um, well, I may, I, maybe I should actually read a poem about that for a second. This poem is uh, about trying to have a child. The Vulture and the Body. On my way to the fertility clinic, I pass five dead animals. First, a raccoon with all four paws to the sky, like he's going to catch whatever bullshit load falls on him next. Then, a grown coyote, his golden furred body soft against the white cement lip of the traffic barrier, trickster no longer, an eye closed to what's coming. Close to the water tower that says, Florence, y'all, which means I'm near Cincinnati, but in the bluegrass state and close to my exit, I see three dead deer, all staggered but together. And I realize as I speed past in my death machine that they are a family. I say something to myself that's between a prayer and a curse. How dare we live on this earth? I want to tell my doctor about how we all hold the duality in our minds, futures entirely different, footloose or forged. I want to tell him how lately it's enough to be reminded that my body is not just my body, but that I'm made of old stars and so is he. And that last Tuesday I sat alone in the car by the post office and just was for a whole hour, not knowing how to find me until I got out the sound of the car door shutting like a gun, and mailed letters, all of them saying, thank you. But in the clinic, the sonogram wand showing my follicles, he asks if I have any questions and says, things are getting exciting. I want to say, but what about all the dead animals? And he goes quicksilver, and I'm left to pull my panties up like a big girl. Some days, there's a violent sister inside of me and a red ladder that wants to go elsewhere. I drive home on the other side of the road, going south now. The white coat has said I'm ready, and I watch as a vulture crosses over me, heading toward the carcasses I haven't properly mourned or even forgiven. What if, instead of carrying a child, I am supposed to carry grief? The great black scavenger flies parallel now, each of us speeding intently and driven toward what we've been taught to do with death. Just, you know, lightening the mood. <laughs> that poem originally appeared um, on Virginia Quarterly uh, website, and they have this marvelous thing that has hashtags underneath the poems. Um, so you can find them, right, if you're looking for a poem on grief, or, and it's kind of nice. But underneath that, um, <laughs> it says, hashtag infertility, hashtag roadkill. <laughs> <laughs> and it just, the funniest thing I'd ever seen. <laughs> I was like, well, okay. <laughs> it sums it up nicely. <laughs> you think that the poem is concise. Um, and I'll just read two more from this book. Um, okay, where is that poem? This is a poem um, that uh, I think talks about r the difference between representation and, and tokenism. So um, it's an important poem to me. The contract says we'd like the conversation to be bilingual. When you come, bring your brownness so we can be sure to please the funders. Will you check this box? We're applying for a grant. Do you have any poems that speak to troubled teens? Bilingual is best. Would you like to come to dinner with the patrons and sip Patron? Will you tell us the stories that make us uncomfortable but not complicit? Don't read us the one where you were just like us. Born to a greenhouse garden, don't tell us how you picked tomatoes and ate them in the dirt, watching vultures pick apart another bird's bones in the road. 
tell us the one about your father, stealing hubcaps, after a colleague said that's what his kind did. Tell us how he came to the meeting, wearing a poncho, and tried to sell the man his hubcaps back. Don't mention your father was a teacher, spoke English, loved making beer, loved baseball. Tell us again about the poncho, the hubcaps, how he stole them, how he did the thing he was trying to prove he didn't do. Um, and that is a true story. My father worked at um, a school district. He was an administrator and a teacher for a while. And um, he was attending a meeting, and they, um, one of the fellow administrators said he didn't want to park a car in a certain area because the Mexicans there would steal his hubcaps. Um, and my father went out and stole the man's hubcaps. <laughs> And, um, and then later, for the next meeting, my father dressed up in a poncho and a sombrero and came back and said, do you, hey, do you want to buy some hubcaps? <laughs> and uh, it really was an amazing turning point in that school district. And w when he left that school district, he, um, uh, they gave him, as a going away present, a, uh, an engraved hubcap. <laughs> So he's, he does a, a, lot of, a lot of beautiful work. It's to honor him. I read that poem once when he was at a festival with me, and um, he, 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 kinda, he loved it. And, um, and he'd walk around the little town and, say, and someone would say, hey, it's Hubcap Guy. And he was like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so the last one I'll read from this poem is um, it's called The Last Drop. It's a prose poem. The Last Drop. You've just left your dad in Virginia and your brother after taking him to the neurologist to confirm that it is, in fact, Alzheimer's. Now you're driving to New York to get your dead ex-girlfriend's cats who need a home, and even though we weren't planning on cats, they're 15, and who's going to take them? And you know them already, and why not give some animals a home? And even if it's another 20 hours of driving there and back. I tell Manuel about your travels, and he says, it's a good premise for a horrible road trip dark comedy movie. <laughs> and there is something funny about it. Your father hates cats, but they love him. And I spent a long time envious of your ex-girlfriend's beauty, and now I only miss her and want to love her cats for her. My memoir could be titled, Everything Was Fine, Until It Wasn't. My memoir could be called, I thought I wanted a baby, but all I got was your dead ex-girlfriend's old cats. <laughs> My memoir could be called, Before the Wedding, You Must Suffer. My mother's motto is, nothing is easy, and I tease her for it. But it's true. Before, her, before he left, your dad said he didn't understand the saying, good to the last drop. Does that mean the last drop is bad? He asked. No, I reassured. It means all of it is good. Every single drop of it is good. Thank you. And I'll read from the new book, um, just five, five short poems. Um, Start with this poem about a groundhog. This book is animal heavy. <laughs> heavy with animals. <laughs> Give me this. I thought it was the neighbor's cat, back to clean the clock of the fledgling robins low in their nest, stuck in the dense hedge by the house. But what came was much stranger, a liquidity moving, all muscle and bristle, a groundhog, slippery and waddle, thieving my tomatoes, still green in the morning shade. I watched her munch and stand on her haunches, taking such pleasure in the watery bites. Why am I not allowed delight? A stranger writes to request my thoughts on suffering. Barbed wire 
pulled out of the mouth as if demanding that I kneel to the trap of coiled spikes used in warfare and fencing. Instead, I watch the groundhog more closely and a sound escapes me, a small spasm of joy I did not imagine when I woke. She is a funny creature and earnest and she is doing what she can to survive. That's when my husband says, the groundhog is you, the groundhog is you. There's <laughs> <laughs> um, a poem that I wrote for my stepmother, and since it were very close to El Dio de los Muertos that was on um, Monday and Tuesday, um, and uh, um, I, there's a lot of resurrection poems in this book, so this is a resurrection poem. For Scythia. At the cabin in Snug Hollow near McSwain Branch Creek, just spring, all the animals are out, and my beloved and I are lying in a soft bed silence. We are talking about how we carry so many people with us wherever we go, how even when simply living these unearned moments are a tribute to the dead. We are both expecting to hear an owl as the night deepens. All afternoon from the porch, we watched an eastern towhee furiously build her nest in the untamed forsythia, with its yellow spilling out in the horizon. I told him that the way I remember the name forsythia is that when my stepmother Cynthia was dying that last week, she said lucidly but mysteriously, more yellow. And I thought, yes, more yellow, and nodded because I agreed, of course, more yellow. And so now, in my head, when I see that yellow tangle, I say, for Cynthia, for Cynthia, for Scythia, for Scythia, more yellow. It is night now, and the owl never comes, only more of night and what repeats in the night. I love for Scythia. You have it blooming around here. Yeah, and it's the first one, right? It's like, hello, spring is here. Yeah. Um, I'll read this poem. Um, I think it's, for me, an important poem because during um, the middle of the pandemic, it felt very uh, necessary to revisit some old myths and toss them away. Um, joint custody. Why did I never see it for what it was? Abundance. Two families, two different kitchen tables, two sets of rules, two creeks, two highways, two step parents with their fish tanks or eight tracks or cigarette smoke or expertise in recipes or reading skills. I cannot reverse it. The record scratched and stopped to that original chaotic track. But let me say, I was taken back and forth on Sundays and it was not easy, but I was loved each place. And so I have two brains now, two entirely different brains, the one that always misses where I'm not and the one that is so relieved to finally be home. Two more poems. This is a poem um, for my, uh, where is that? funny when new books come out, you're like, oh, oh, here it is. I wanted to read this for my friend Amy, who's here. Um, and uh, Amy Nizuko Matadal has been one of my uh, friends and uh, I want to say in some ways cohort, like as we've moved through this world together. And um, she published this poem of mine when it first came out, and so I wanted to read this for her. The mountain lion. I watched the video clip over and over. Night vision cameras flickering her eyes an unholy green. The way she looked, the six foot fence up and down like it was nothing but a speed bump. Then cleared the man-made border in one impressive leap. A glance over the shoulder, an annoyance, and 
as if you could keep me out or keep me in. I don't know what it was that made me press replay and replay, not fear, though I'd be terrified if I was face to face with her or heard her prowling in the night. It was just that I don't think I've ever made anything look so easy. Never looked behind me and grinned or grimaced because nothing could stop me. I liked the idea of it, though. Felt like a dream you could will into being. See a fence? Jump it. <laughs> um, and I'll close with this poem, uh, which I referenced today in one of the panels about a poem uh, that I wrote, uh, which was um, when I thought poetry had forsaken me and I felt like there was sort of no point in writing poems again. Um, and I went through all the topics I wanted to write about and I was like, oh, no, uh, that's not what I need. And then, of course, I wrote this poem. <laughs> the End of Poetry. Enough of osseous and chickadee and sunflower and snowshoes, maple and seeds, samaran shoot. Enough chioscuro, enough of thusts and prophecy and the stoic farmer and faith and our father and tis of thee. Enough of bosom and buds, skin and God not forgetting and star bodies and frozen birds. Enough of the will to go on and not go on or how a certain light does a certain thing. Enough of the kneeling and the rising and the looking inward and the looking up. Enough of the gun, the drama, the acquaintance's suicide, the long lost letter on the dresser. Enough of the longing and the ego and the obliteration of ego. Enough of the mother and the child and the father and the child. And enough of the pointing to the world, weary and desperate. Enough of the brutal and the border. Enough of can you see me, can you hear me. Enough I am human, enough I am alone and I am desperate. Enough of the animal saving me, enough of the high water. Enough Enough sorrow, enough of the air and its ease. I am asking you to touch me. Thank you. Um, so we've listened to a novel and some short stories and some poetry, and I'm fascinated by the value of words as the work gets smaller, more mm, condensed. Mm. Um, you use the word unruly, mm. which is one of my favorites. Mm. Thank you, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, but how do you know when you've said just enough? Mm. Like you, you haven't missed anything that you've intended to say, and you also haven't said too much. Mm -hmm. How do you know you're done mm. with something? Yeah. Um, thanks for that question. I think it's really hard to tell. Um, sometimes what happens to me is that I'm, I read and write out loud. So um, I, as I write each line, I'm reading it out loud. I'm listening for the sound of it. Um, and it's really musical for me. And so oftentimes the end, when I, it's like I, I feel that there's, the end is there, um, but I have to make sure I'm reading it over and over again to make sure that the sound is there. And if the sound is there, then I think it's, uh, it's near complete. Um, my biggest issue usually is overwriting, not underwriting. Um, so usually I, I know that I, it's my job to pull back a little bit as opposed to keep expanding. Um, I know some poets probably should actually write more. Um, I'm the person that tends to need a little bit of, of culling in. Uh, but for me, it's, it's a whole body physical experience in both the ear and the eye that I'm reading it and going, oh, it's that's the ending. Um, it also feels like it's when the poem is still surprising to me. Um, if I try to sum it up, 
I think that I'm in danger of often saying, and that is why, you know? And that's the thing, uh, with poetry especially, um, I always have to push back against, is to make sure I leave enough room to trust the reader, that even if it's not exactly how I intend it when you receive it, it still belongs to you and we have an exchange. Whereas if I have that summing up or, and you know, this is it, then there's not an exchange, it's just me telling you something. Um, so I need to leave room for that mystery. Yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, how, usually when I write poetry, a lot of my poetry tends to come from people and experiences that I get from them, but a lot of the time I'm way too scared to like write it and say it because I'm like, what if they find it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so scared of like, this is something that happened to me. And then like the person it's about will find it. I'm like, oh no. Yeah. Um, specifically, I, a, a lot of the times it's like, I'm gonna write about my mom. And then it's like, uh oh. Yeah. <laughs> how, how do you find yourself becoming, because poetry is a lot of vulnerability. Yeah. How do you kind of practice getting to that level of vulnerability where you can kind of just put it behind you like, yeah, I said it, who cares? Yeah. Yeah, I, you know what? You never do. Um, uh -oh. I, I know, I know. I wish, I wish my answer was like, yeah, I said it and I don't care. Uh, no, um, here's the thing. I think that um, we spend a lot of time telling creative writers that we get the power because we're the writers and you should just write whatever you want. And I think that's absolutely true. You should write whatever you want. But until you're ready to have that conversation, you may not want to share that poem into the world. Um, and I'll tell you that I've had that happen to me. I've written a poem that I was in a vulnerable state. I wrote it about my father, who I'm very close with. Um, I did not think that he was going to take it in any bad way, um, and he did. Um, and he wrote me an essay. I think you can say it's an essay if there's an email with an attachment. <laughs> it also had a title. So um, that's an essay. And he wrote me that in response to this poem. And, you know, it, it, I was unprepared for it. And I think that it taught me the lesson of, like, write. You can do the work. Write what you want to write. Get it all out there. But if you're not quite ready to share it, you may want to do some of that groundwork. You may want to be like, hey, I wrote this poem. Would you want to see it? Hey, here's a, the new manuscript. Here. You might want to do that only because my biggest fear is that if you are not prepared and someone does receive a poem and it goes poorly, it may silence you forever. And I always think about that great, um, uh, that great Buddhist monk, Lama Rod Owens, who says the goal is longevity. And I think that's so key for writers because we want you to keep on writing. So it, whatever way that you can protect yourself and know that that could be a backlash. And so how do you want to handle that? You know, does it mean that you write a bunch of other poems that, you know, that may not be the, those poems right now? Or you write those poems and you stick them in a drawer until you might be like, hey, mom, this is going to happen. And it may be the poem that makes it happen. And you may be closer for it, you know, or you may not. But it, I think that it's good to remember that real writing does have impact. It does make a connection. And it does and can have consequences. And some of those consequences can be beautiful. And some of those consequences can be hard. But I would be lying to you if I said it wasn't. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Kind of on that same note, you seem to write about your family a lot. Mm -hmm. And you guys seem like a great bunch. Mm -hmm. um, do they have favorite things that you've written about them where they're like, you wrote that about me, like yeah. I can't believe you remember this experience or something. Yeah, yeah, they do. Um, and thank you for asking that. I think that one of the things, um, I was, I wrote two poems about my mother that are pretty hard. Uh, well, one of them is pretty hard that I didn't read tonight, but the, um, and then there's the poem, The Raincoat, and I, I sent them both to her because, in, in fact, the other poem starts like, this is not my story to tell because it's about her body. My mother was, is burned and scarred over most of her body. Um, and, and so I had sent these two poems and I said, these are, I, you know, I was gonna send them out, but I'm not gonna, you, can, you have total veto power. And I didn't hear from her. And I thought, oh no. And if I didn't hear from her, I thought, you know, 15 minutes. 
I was like, if you knew my mom, that was like a lifetime <laughs> to not hear from my mom. And um, I, then I texted my stepdad and was like, is she okay? I, wrote, I sent these poems and I haven't heard from her. And he's like, no, she loves them. She's crying. And it was like, okay, good. Like this is like they're moving to her and she gave me full. But it made, it made a big deal. Like I was writing about her body. I was writing about her skin, you know? It, couldn't, it would not have been okay for me to have sent that out into the world without her w wanting that to go out in the world or being okay with that being out in the world. Um, and then uh, my older brother is uh, always surprised that I remember anything. So he's like, yeah. He's like, that's, so, he, he, cause he, has, he, he always says he doesn't have a good memory. And so he loves out anything that I write because he's like, I do remember that. Now I remember it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so often I, I think about um, the, finding the motivation to write poetry is um, similar to finding the motivation to get up out of bed, yeah. right? Where some days, you know, you jump out and you're really excited to do whatever you have to do that day. Um, but some days it's so tiring yeah. and it's, it's so hard to find, to find the strength. Mm. Um, so I was wondering if there was any place that you go emotionally or physically to help you get there and how you can reconcile with having to force yourself sometimes. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's a couple ways. But I think there's, you know, there's one in which I, I remember. Um, I mean, this is very, this is very true, but it, I, I really think about all my ancestors. And I think about who didn't get to make art. And they didn't get to make, I mean, my grandfather crossed a border and lived in a chicken coop. You know, I mean, he didn't get to make art. And I think I get to make art. And life might be hard, but I'm not going to lay down and give up. And I'm not going to do that because part of me owes that to them. And I can't help but think about like how lucky I am to get to do anything, including getting up out of bed, you know, and um, I, you know losing a stepmother at 50, you know, before she reached 52. Like that's that's another part of that. It's like yeah, it might be hard to get out of bed, but you know what's harder? You know, it's not getting to get out of bed. And um, though I, it sounds morbid, but that, those things keep me going all the time. And when I feel like giving up, I just, I, I, I think, I, who am I to do that? You know, part of me is, 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 is part of them. And I know that they're in me right now. And I think that they're keeping me going. And I think we all have people like that in our lives, whether they're people from blood or whether people we choose, you know. Yeah, thanks. Hi, I'm trying not to fangirl because you've been like my favorite poet since I was 12. Oh, um, but you, you mentioned feeling that poetry had forsaken you. How, what advice, and please don't feel the need that you actually have to answer with your personal situation, but what advice do you have for those of us who feel the same way and yeah. haven't found it again yet? Yeah, I think, thank you for that. Um, I think that for me, there are times where art making, it's very, it, it, that it does feel like, what am I doing? What am I doing? You know, like I should be saving seeds. You know, I should be saving the planet. <laughs> I should be, you know, all of these things. And, um, and so there are these times, I mean, I remember even in the heart of the pandemic where people would actually call me and say like, you know, people need poetry now more than ever. And I was like, no, they need a vaccine. Like this is, <laughs> you, I mean, like poetry is great, but Better health care would be good, you know. I, so I think that there are moments where it just, it does feel like making art does feel, God, like this frivolous thing that, you know, what do we do? Um, but I will say, honestly, I feel like it does save me. And I know that I have been saved by other people's poems, by other people's novels, by other people's movies, by music. I mean, it does. And, uh, and that's what keeps me going back to it is that even if it, my art can't save me or I'm feeling so forsaken of, of making my own thing, it's to go back and, and remember, 
oh, here are these other people making things, or you know, here is like, I'm just gonna turn on Otis Redding Pain in my heart and I'll be okay, you know? Something like that. So it's about reshaping it and, and shaking it up again because, yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to be an artist in this world uh, when we wanna be many things. Yeah, thank you. Hi, I have a question about putting collections of poems mm -hmm. together. Um, do you start a book with an idea or do you have a file system of here's a thousand poems that I'm gonna gather together and cull through until I have a collection? Mm. Or is it kind of a mixture of both? Do you have a collection, say I have a hole, I need to fill it, I write for, mm. I write a poem to fill that hole, or you know, I mean, what is your process of taking all these disparate different ideas yeah. and bringing them together into a single volume? Yeah, that's a great question. I love putting together manuscripts. Um, it's one of my favorite things to do. Um, so I guess Amy and I might be a little oddball here because she loves revision and I like putting together manuscripts and most poets would be hate both of those things. Um, so <laughs> we're like, oh, putting together a book is great. Um, but I think for me, I, I, I never have a thousand poems. I just, I'm, I'm prolific in a way that is like very private. So I write a lot, but I don't really edit and, and send things out that often, surprisingly enough, but I don't. Um, and so when I feel like there's something um, happening, it's usually when I have about 20 or 30 poems and I think, oh, there's something going on here. I don't know what it is yet, but something's happening. And, um, and then I think, okay, well, where's, where, what's the thing I'm leaving out? Like if that thing is happening, then what am I leaving out, right? If this is a poem about, if this is a book about my life, and these are, this is, these are all these individual poems that have been written over the five years, and this is about, I can see this thread of being a mother, or maybe not being a mother, or infertility, or maybe like, you know, being with my husband and his father's Alzheimer's, or all these things. I'm thinking, oh, what's happening here? And then I'm like, oh, maybe we need a poem about maybe not wanting to be a mother. That's never been there. You know, or maybe we need a poem, and I give myself prompts. Right? Like, oh, what is it like to be in a room full of moms when you're not a mom? That's an interesting thing. Right? I've never talked about that. Maybe that's an interesting poem that I could start getting into. So it's not really an idea, because it's usually sound or something that excites me to actually bring me into the poem, but I'll have it in the back of my head. Being like there might be a way into making this fuller or making this into really um, a book that might be about something or might have some teeth. Um, but yeah, I mean, I wish I was that person that was like, here are a thousand poems. I don't know how, what order they would go into, but no, I'm, I generally will build books. Um, and I think of them uh, like building a long poem. What's it like being U.S. Poet Laureate? Mm, yeah, yes, thank you. Yes. Um, it's pretty amazing. It's, uh, uh, I will tell you that I got the call in June, um, and it was, a, um, <laughs> it was a Zoom that was set up by my representative, Von Fielder, who's a marvelous human being, and she said, you're going to want to be on this Zoom call at 9 a.m., and I said, well, I've got physical therapy that day, so I'm probably going to need to miss that. I don't know what it is. And she was like, you're going to need to cancel your physical therapy appointment. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to want to be on this Zoom. And then I, I got on and she said, also, you might want to do your hair. I mean, thank God she said that. <laughs> She's like, so I did my hair and I was like, I, I have, and I had no clue. And, you know, Amy's in the, po she knows that there's, there's no, you don't know that this is happening. It's not something you apply for. It's not something that's on your radar in any way, shape or form. Um, and I sat down and I turned on and they even had it encoded so it didn't say um, the Library of Congress on the Zoom. And I clicked on it and in the middle of the Zoom call was Dr. Carla Hayden and I recognized her as the Librarian of Congress. And um, she started, I started laughing and she said, do you have any idea what this is about? And I was like, well, yeah, now I do. <laughs> I think I do, yes. And, um, and she said it was one of the greatest honors of her life to do this part of her job. And, um, she invited me to be the 24th Poet Laureate of the United States. 
Um, and I, my first thought was, oh, someone else must have said no. <laughs> I'm not even making that up. That was my first thought. Um, I mean, I, and I held on that for a long time, and finally I even made that joke, and Rob was like, what are you talking about? That's not what happens. Like, no one says no to this. <laughs> He's like, first of all, no one says no. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, and it's been incredible. Um, they've been in incredibly supportive. Um, one of the things that's been marvelous is that the Library of Congress itself is first and foremost an incredible library. You know, it has 163 million items. It's, yeah, it's the largest library in the world. Um, it is extraordinary. Um, I was in there holding a book from 1717 by Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, you know. It feels like it's, you know, you just, you can hear it. It makes a sound when it opens. Um, there's just the, I got to hold Walt Whitman's walking stick. You know, there's a, there's a poem, the Robert Frost poem, um, Nothing Gold Can Stay. He actually, it's a handwritten copy of his with an alternate ending. I mean, these things are just like, how is this possible? We got to see George Washington's personal copy of the Declaration of Independence. Um, it was the declaration that was literally tucked into his, his um, satchel. And when he they, like, was ridden you know, by horses, got to him, arrived, they literally read it out loud to his troops and then went down to, to take the statue down of King George III. I mean, those, the, the, the library itself is just a remarkable thing. And the thing that I keep being, I, I mentioned ancestors before, but there's something that keeps coming back about this is that it's not about me. It feels like it's about like this legacy of protecting our history and the, col the collective knowledge and appreciation of art that has been going on for years. People who you know, made sure that some book from this Mexican writer, Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, who was a nun, right, made sure that it was safe and protected, and now I get to look at it. Like, that, that kind of, it's that care that people have taken to preserve art that has been really phenomenal. Um, yes, but it's, it's been a beautiful experience. Just thank you for that, yeah, thank you.